Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Victoria Memorial Hall, I would like to welcome every one of you and uh, extend my thanks to those who have taken a firm decision to spend this wonderful afternoon indoors um, at our conference hall. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Jennifer House. Dr. House is an art historian specializing in the art of British imperialism or British imperialist art. She was awarded her PhD in art and archaeology from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and worked for 14 years at the British Library as curator of visual arts. In 2003, she published her PhD thesis under the title The Courts of Pre-Colonial South India and in 2010, Dr. House published her second book on the British Library's McKinsey Collection. As we eagerly await her upcoming book, The Art of a Corporation, the East India Company as Patron and Collector, perhaps today we have a rare opportunity to get an early glimpse of that wonderful work through the, her discussion of the evolution of the image of Robert Clive in British art. Without any further ado, I would like to invite our program consultant, Mr. Raju Raman, to present her with a small token of our appreciation. Um, as is customary, please put your phones on silent or preferably in switch off mode uh, or airplane if you prefer so. Um, yeah, there's really no point in any further delay, so I would now invite Dr. House to the lectern to deliver her lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kind introduction. I'd like to thank Dr. Sengupta for inviting me to be here today and the Victoria Memorial Hall's staff and everyone who's shown up for this lecture. In the Victoria Memorial Hall, there's a marble statue of Robert Clive. It's pictured here on the left side it's one of a pair of identical statues that were simultaneously made by the same sculptor, John Tweed, between 1910 and 1912 in his London studio. While the marble statue is inside this building, the bronze statue is in London in a public location known as the Clive Steps and it's located next to the old India office building and it overlooks St. James's Park. These two statues, statues were paid for through the Clive Memorial Fund, which was established by George Nathaniel Curzon. The fund's purpose was to celebrate Clive's legacy as, and I quote, the foundations of an empire more enduring than Alexander's, more splendid than the Caesar's. This is just the sort of imperialist rhetoric that was common a hundred years ago. In this talk, I'm going to look at some other portraits of Robert Clive, both in painting and in sculpture that predate these two statues. There we are. These are the artworks I'm going to look at. The dates inside the blue arrows indicate when the artworks were completed. All of these artworks were intended to promote Robert Clive as a hero of empire. I'm going to contextualize them to chart the rise, fall, and resurrection of Robert Clive's image in the 18th and 19th centuries. Narratives of Robert Clive's career are important to post-colonial studies. To trace these narratives, 
one only has to look at these portraits. They're valuable sources for understanding Clive's oscillating image. Today in Britain, opinions on Robert Clive's legacy are extremely polarized. One side still sees him as a hero, and the other regards him as a dangerous, backward symbol of Britain's imperial past. I hope to show here that these images have fed into debates about Clive's legacy from the 18th century right up to the current day. I'm going to just briefly talk about these four artworks before I continue, so. The first artwork on the top left, completed in 1760, was painted by Francis Heyman, and it shows Robert Clive meeting Mir Jafar after the Battle of Plassey. The second artwork, top middle, is a marble sculpture of Robert Clive in Roman military costume, which was completed in 1764. The third painting, the one on the right, is by Edward Penny, and it shows Clive with the Nawab of Bengal founding a pension scheme for the East India Company's invalids. And this painting was completed in 1772. The fourth painting on the bottom left is Benjamin West's painting of Shah Alam handing over the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar, and Arissa to Clive. I'm going to ask the same four questions about each of these artworks. First, who commissioned them? Who paid for them? Second, why were they made? Third, where were they displayed? And fourth, how have they been interpreted? This is the earliest picture of Robert Clive to appear in British art. And it looks nothing like him. It's an oil painting titled, Robert Clive Receiving the Homage of the Nabob. And it was painted by Francis Heyman. <coughs> Who commissioned it? This painting was privately commissioned by a man named Jonathan Tyres. He was the owner of a pleasure garden in London called the Vauxhall Gardens. And he ran it as a business. He charged visitors admission to come in and experience its amusements. There were musicians, an open air theater, games, art displays, and places where you could buy food and drink. It was a popular meeting place for families, friends, business associates, and lovers. And if you were lucky, you could catch a glimpse of a famous person. So this um, cartoon shows just one area of the Vauxhall Gardens where people went to listen to live music. So um, in the pavilion on the left, on the top level, you can see there's an orchestra playing. And then there's a, a woman who's, she's leaning over the balcony towards the crowd below. And she's, she's singing. She's singing to the crowd. And the crowd below, as you can see, it's, it's a mixed group. It's made up of men, women, and children. Then below the pavilion, uh, on the ground level, on the, um, uh, the, the left side, you can see there's a, a, uh, a rather uh, large man in a red coat uh, eating at a table. And then on the, uh, on the other corner, on the right side, there's another group of, of diners. They're seated around a table. And um, there's a, a waiter in a blue coat who's um, uncorking 
a bottle of wine for them. He sort of bent a little bit, you know, at the knees. So it was a, it was a lively place. It was a place where you went to to see things and to be seen. The Clive painting by Francis Heyman was exhibited inside a pavilion in the Vauxhall Gardens called the Pillared Saloon. And inside the Pillared Saloon, in 1760, when this was exhibited, there were actually three other Heyman paintings of equal dimensions. So getting back to this specific painting titled Robert Clive Receiving the, the Homage of the Nabob, it, it dramatizes the events immediately after the Battle of Plassey in 1757. And it's, it's very much fiction. It's, um, Heyman has, he's, he's theatrically shown Clive as this handsome young man, his arms are spread wide, facing Mir Jafar, and the Mughal commander who uh, was about to become the new Nawab of Bengal is, you know, staring back at him, you know, like they're going to be the best of friends. Um, so Heyman's painting sentimentalized this event. It played upon emotions that helped make Robert Clive into a household name. It was designed to evoke nationalist sentiments in Britain that praised the emergence of an international empire with London at its center. This painting, along with the other three paintings by Francis Heyman, which were also in the Pillared Saloon, depicted different aspects of Britain's overseas military exploits in the 1750s. In the same pavilion, there were musicians who played songs that related to these events as well. So by combining music and art, the pillared saloon exuded an 18th century vision of Britain's imperial strength. In London at that time, Britain's overseas victories were a popular topic. So visiting the Vauxhall Gardens and going into the pillared saloon to see this and the other three paintings was a kind of reportage where the public learned a version of these events. In 1760, the same year that this painting was displayed in the Vauxhall Gardens, the next artwork was commissioned. Oh, gosh. There it is. This is the marble statue of Robert Clive in Roman costume. Who commissioned it? In September 1760, the East India Company's shareholders voted unanimously to commission Peter Schiemacher's to make this sculpture of Robert Clive dressed as a Roman general. The East India Company was now participating in this trend of commissioning artworks that fed into an emerging wave of imperialist nationalism. Why was it commissioned? Why do we have Clive in Roman costume? Well, as I expect you can probably guess, it has to do with Imperial Rome being seen as a model for the East India Company's conquests. Clive's Imperial Roman attire was a bold reference to the spread of the Roman Empire, which had extended across Europe all the way to Britain and controlled millions of foreign subjects through a disciplined army. So the East India Company was comparing itself to the spread of Imperial Rome and its, and its place within creating this new emerging empire. So this explains why Robert Clive is dressed as a Roman general. Where was it displayed? Here's where it was displayed. 
the statue of Clive in Roman costume was placed inside the general courtroom of East India House in London. I've drawn a, a blue circle around it. So this room, the, um, the general courtroom, was the largest, most public area of East India House. It was where the company's shareholders, known as proprietors, attended quarterly meetings. It was also used as the East India Company's sale room, where goods imported to London were sold by auction. In this picture, we see the general courtroom functioning as the sale room. It's crowded with merchants looking to buy imported merchandise. The statue of Robert Clive up above them was a reminder of how the company's mercantile dominance was achieved. How was the statue of Robert Clive received? Well, initially, I, I guess it was received quite well. But then things changed, as you, I'm sure you all know. In 1765, one year after the statue was installed inside East India House, Robert Clive returned to India as the governor of Bengal. And it was during this period in the late 1760s that Clive accepted the Mughal Diwani on behalf of the East India Company from Shah Alam. And through this, this transaction, the Mughal Empire lost its most prosperous territories and the East India Company disastrously became the tax collector for these regions. Robert Clive returned to England in the late 1760s and he brought with him a staggering personal fortune. It was speculated that he was the richest man in Europe. He went on to conspicuously surround himself with the trappings of an English aristocrat. He bought vast tracts of land in Wales, Palladian townhouses in London and Bath, and country homes in Shropshire and Surrey. He arranged for Claremont, his estate in Surrey, to be completely redesigned by the famous architect Capability Brown. And there was a lot of public speculation about how much cash Clive had poured into these various projects. He was famous, he was still famous, and this fame paired with his insatiable spending made him a target of criticism, particularly when news reached Britain of the Bengal famine. The British public turned against him and they questioned Clive, wondering how his colossal fortune was amassed. It literally looked as if he had robbed Bengal and left its people to die. He was nicknamed Lord Vulture, but he received some other vicious sobriquets. In 1771, the statue was criticized in a satirical memoir that renamed Robert Clive as Nero Asiaticus. This desultory nickname for Clive connects with this statue. To compare him with Nero, the insane Roman emperor who played the violin while Rome burnt to the ground. The memoir of Nero Asiaticus was published less than 10 years after the marble sculpture was completed. And it shows how quickly Clive's reputation changed from a military hero to an insane villain. So he'd ignored the ravages of the Bengal famine while seated in his opulent surroundings, making him Nero Asiaticus, 
the most infamous nabob in Britain. This brings us to the next portrait of Clive, which was also commissioned by the East India Company. So this is Edward Penny's painting of Clive founding the East India Company's pension scheme. So who commissioned it? It was commissioned by the East India Company in 1770, and it was completed in 1772. And of course, this was the exact moment when Robert Clive was being villainized in Britain. The painting shows that the East India Company was clinging to Robert Clive's earlier image as their hero, their poster boy of empire. It might have even been commissioned to help heal Clive's deteriorating image. It focuses on an action which in Britain was reported as a great moment of philanthropy, the founding of the East India Company's pension scheme. It was painted by Edward Penny, the Royal Academy's professor of painting, who was famous for his portraits of men performing heroic deeds. This pension scheme, also known as Lord Clive's Fund, is regarded even today as the first corporate pension to be established in the city of London. It was set up in April 1770, purportedly by Robert Clive and the Nawab of Bengal. <clears throat> it was set up to financially assist old and disabled East India Company soldiers in Britain, along with widows and orphans. Where was it displayed? The East India Company constructed a new side entrance where the pension fund office was headquartered. So it was a separate entrance for people collecting pensions that they could go into. And the painting decorated this new entrance. So the people who walked into the pension fund's office were confronted by this painting, which celebrated the moment when the pension scheme was founded. The painting casts Robert Clive as a great man who cared deeply for the welfare of British men and their families. But this is interesting. The company paid for the painting not out of its profits, but out of the funds that were designated for the pension scheme. Let's take a closer look at the painting. It shows Clive dressed in an East India Company uniform, a red cloak and breeches, with a white shirt and stockings. He's wearing a red sash across his yellow waistcoat, and his sword's hilt is hanging from his left hip. The document in his right hand is the warrant for the Nawab's legacy, which funded the pension scheme. He's looking directly at Najim Uddala, the son of Mir Jafar, while gesturing towards some sick and injured men who are dressed in different East India Company military uniforms. And then further back, there's a beautiful young widow with a baby on her lap, surrounded by three small children. Najim Uddala appears shocked by these needy people, indicating his full support for the scheme. His courtiers stand supportively behind him on the painting's left side. The painting was completed in 1772, 
But before it was installed inside East India House, it was exhibited at the Royal Academy under the effusive title, I need a drink of water before I say this, <clears throat> under the effusive title, I quote, Lord Clive explaining to the Nabob the situation of the invalids in India at the same time showing him a deed whereby he relinquishes Mir Jafar's legacy five lakhs of rupees to the Honourable East India Company for the support of a military fund. End of title. The painting was displayed in the Royal Academy in 1772. That, this cartoon, it shows uh, the Royal, uh, a scene from the Royal Academy's annual exhibition. So like the Vauxhall Gardens, the Royal Academy was a popular public meeting place in London. Edward Penny's painting would have been seen by thousands of people before it was relocated to East India House. The cartoon in this slide gives an idea of what these exhibitions were like. Royal Academy exhibitions were paid events where you, you, you must pay an admission charge and then you could go in and see artworks that were by contemporary British artists. And they showed contemporary themes. They maybe showed faraway places, famous people, um, topical events. So it, it, was, it was an important event. It was a, an event that people would talk about. And you can see here that uh, just like the Vauxhall Gardens, these exhibitions attracted a mixed crowd of men, women, and you can even see a couple of children. There's, there's a really bored looking kid sitting on a bench, sort of in the foreground. How was the painting received? Is, yes? Is this cut from the Rolling Yes, I think it is, yes. How was the painting received? Well, it wasn't very well received because, as already discussed, Britain's public at that time was quite reasonably questioning Robert Clive's character. And when the Royal Academy's exhibition opened in April 1772, Robert Clive was making headlines because he was being interrogated by Parliament on corruption charges. Town and Country Magazine, the same publication that printed the memoir of Nero Asiaticus, published a cartoon that was based on Edward Penny's painting. The cartoon, which you see here on the left side, is titled the India Directors in the Suds. This is a complicated cartoon that it, it, it references all kinds of things, but I think it's worth saying here, and I want to stress this, that suds in the late 18th century was a euphemism for sewage. The cartoon completely subverted the painting's intended message. Instead of showing Clive as an altruistic, public-minded person, it depicts him as a coward and a criminal. In the cartoon, Robert Clive is shown stepping backwards in horror from a ghostly group of men who walk towards him through a dreamlike haze. Clive has moved so forcefully that he has knocked over a chair and dropped the warrant that was in his right hand. It lies on the ground with the single word apology written upon it. Behind Clive, in place of the injured soldiers and the widow, the directors of the East India Company sit remorselessly around a table. The compositional similarities between Edward Penny's painting 
and the cartoon are so clear that the anonymous cartoonist must have drawn it while standing in front of the painting. Both pictures show Indian men on the left, European men on the right, and an identical placement of shadowing, particularly in the foreground. And by that, I'm, um, you can see um, on the, uh, the right-hand corner of both images, you have these sort of triangles of dark, um, dark shading. It's, it's the same. Although his hat has fallen off, the cartoon figure of Clive is wearing the same outfit as in the painting, with a sash across his chest, a sword hanging from his left hip. The company's directors, <clears throat> seated behind him, are posed in the same way as the group of destitute soldiers. And the Nawab and his entourage have been replaced by a crowd of Indian men standing inside of this cloud of mist. The sheet of paper on the ground with the word apology written on it imitates the warrant that Clive shows Najim Uddala in the painting. And then instead of the Nawab gesturing compliantly to the warrant, the man in the cartoon in the cloud of mist is pointing at himself, indicating who should receive an apology. The cartoon was accompanied by descriptive text that refers to several scandals that the company was embroiled in. And I won't get into this in detail, except to say that the Indian figures on the left are described as, and I quote, the ghosts of the black merchants. They allude to the deceased victims of the Bengal famine. In the text, the ghosts are speaking. One demands justice for, and I quote, my property, my life, my children. And Clive responds by imploring the directors, I quote, gentlemen, save me from the fangs of these demons. To which one of the black merchants replies, who can save thee from the hell of thine own conscience? Another one of the black merchants addresses Clive as follows. Thou universal dealer in fortunes and lives, art now come with thy hypocritic faith to deceive thy masters, worm out their secrets under the mask of friendship, only to betray them. But they may take the ghost's word, who knows thee well, that you smilest but to deceive. So this cartoon, this cartoon lampooned the endemic corruption within the East India Company, but it targeted Robert Clive specifically as the source of the company's overseas crimes. It shows awareness that the painting was being used as a propaganda tool. And for town and country's uh, readership, the connection between Edward Penny's painting and the cartoon of the India directors in the Suds would have been clear. On the 22nd of November, 1774, Robert Clive committed suicide. The East India Company would have ordinarily honored the passing away of a hero, but this was embarrassing. So the company conveniently ignored Robert Clive's death. Let's move on to the next painting. So this painting shows the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam conveying the grant of the Diwani to Robert Clive in August 1765. And it was painted 
by Benjamin West. Who commissioned it? It was commissioned by Robert Clive in around 1770, but it wasn't completed until 1795, over two decades after his death. Why was it made? Robert Clive intended this painting to be displayed inside the dining room of Claremont, his country house in Surrey that was designed by Capability Brown. When Robert Clive died in 1774, it's believed that work on the painting stopped. The canvas remained with the Clive family. Then in 1795, it was completed by Benjamin West and exhibited at the Royal Academy under the title, Lord Clive receiving from the Mughal the grant of the Diwani. The painting remained with the Clive family until 1820, when it was given by Lord Edward Clive, Robert Clive's son, to the East India Company. Where was it displayed in East India House? In 1820, the painting was installed inside the Committee of Correspondence Room of East India House. There's no picture of this room, but through written descriptions and architectural plans like this one, we know that it was displayed on the back wall, which I've marked with a red line. The room was high ceilinged and rectangular and it was on the ground floor of London's East India House. It was about 30 feet long and 20 feet wide. It was next to the private offices of the company's chairman and the deputy chairman. You can see their offices um, down at the bottom of the that detail of that plan. So, and you can see where the door is. It's near to the, uh, the offices. So when you walked through that door into the Committee of Correspondence Room, the first thing you would have seen was this painting. It was right in front of you. It was a relatively private room. It was set away from the building's front entrance, and it was where the chairman, his deputy, and a very small select group of the company's highest ranking directors would meet with the small elite secretarial staff. The Committee of Correspondence's role was to draft letters, correspondence that was sent to India. And the topics of these letters were varied, but their core purpose was to set agendas and to issue instructions from London pertaining to financial matters and staffing in India. When Robert Clive commissioned this painting in around 1770, he was one of the most villainized men in Europe, in Britain. In 1820, half a century later, when the painting went into this room in East India House, it was connected with the reinvention of Robert Clive's image as a hero. Robert Clive's son, Edward Clive, gave the painting to the East India Company when significant changes were occurring in the company's operations. In the early 19th century, the East India Company was changing from being a mercantile venture to a bureaucracy. 
the company was originally founded by traders who sought to make money by importing goods to London. But by the early 19th century, this was no longer its key source of income. It, its key source of income was taxation. So um, it then followed that its monopoly with South Asia was withdrawn in 1813. And with this loss of trade, the East India Company became a bureaucracy that was used to oversee the administration of India um, in a way that served British interests. So for the East India Company, this painting of Clive visualized this new administration. It crystallized this moment, the moment that they identified as when it symbolically took administrative control of India. The year before Edward Clive gave the painting to the East India Company, a new civil servant was appointed to head up the Committee of Correspondence. And that man was the historian, James Mill, who published the history of British India in 1817. James Mill had never been to Asia, but his book supported the company's new bureaucratic agenda in the 19th century. The East India Company promoted Mill's history as a seminal work and made it required reading for trainee civil servants. In the book, Mill reinterpreted Robert Clive's actions in South Asia as those of a hero of empire. So Mill acknowledged that Clive had this pernicious reputation, but he did so in a forgiving way, claiming that when held in balance, Clive's actions were heroic rather than destructive. Benjamin West's painting of Robert Clive was displayed in that very same room where James Mill was employed to work, the Committee of Correspondence Room. And the painting visualized the company's newly resurrected attitude, as described by Mill, that Robert Clive was a hero. So how was the painting received? Well, it was in a very private part of East India House, so very few people would have seen it. So there, there wasn't much, um, much reaction to it, to be honest. Um, but perhaps more importantly, the narrative that it represented was further developed by Victorian and post-Victorian writers and authors. Most criticisms of this painting, hold on, where is the painting? Have I got it again here? Most criticisms of this painting are recent. For example, um, in William Dalrymple's book, The Anarchy, he's pointed out very clearly that the painting bears absolutely no resemblance to the historical event it is meant to show. For me, what's really important about this painting is the fictional narrative in Benjamin West's painting and how it reflects the East India Company's 19th century imperialist beliefs. You know, that it relates to the East India Company morphing into this bureaucracy. The subject matter of this painting was woven into the Victorian narrative of Robert Clive as a hero of empire, which was part of the late Rogers ideology. Today, many people still regard the narrative of Clive as a hero as an indisputable truth. Okay, I'm gonna move on to my conclusion now. So 
so to conclude, I'm going to go back to the two statues of Robert Clive by John Tweed. We have the bronze one in London and the marble one in Kolkata. They represent the continuation of this imperialist belief that British values were a force for good in India. George Nathaniel Curzon founded the Lord Clive Memorial Fund that paid for the two sculptures by Tweed. And he arranged for them to be prominently displayed in Britain's two main cities of empire, Kolkata and London. The bronze statue in London was installed in 1916 on the specially planned Clive steps. So the steps are at the foot of King Charles Street and the statue is positioned so it looks into St. James's Park. So this is the view, I took this picture in St. James's Park, looking across the street at the Clive steps. The statue's plinth is plainly inscribed at the front with the name Clive in capital letters that are nearly a foot tall. On the other three sides of the plinth, there are bronze plaques, also by John Tweed, that narrate three moments from Robert Clive's career in India. One of these plaques, oh yes, yeah, so you can see one, there's one plaque there, um, which is uh, the, what is it, the Battle of Arcot on that side. Um, and I asked this couple to stand there so you can get some idea of the, the scale of this thing. So they're standing at the top of the steps and it's still way, way up above your heads. <coughs> One of these plaques is based on Benjamin West's painting of Robert Clive and Shah Alam. And it's actually on the side of the plinth that faces the India office building. So if you were in the room in the India office where the Benjamin West painting of Clive and Shah Alam was displayed, you could look out the window and you could see this plaque on the side of the plinth. There, yeah. I, I thought I'd put them side by side so you can see um, how Tweed has, he's taken that central part of the painting and transposed it into the, uh, the bronze plaque. The three bronze plaques surrounding the plinth show how Robert Clive's life and work was narrated to Britain's public over a hundred years ago. At that time, it was part of Britain's state ideology to normalize its overseas empire. John Tweed's statue of Clive is an early 20th century example of how Britain's white elitist imperial frontage absorbed the East India Company's 19th century image to make a statement about Britain's greatness. More recently, the Clive statue has gained a bit of attention. Here's what it looked like in the summer of 2020, when the Me Too movement called for the removal of public statues that glorified the lives of slavers warmongers and imperialists. So this slide shows the police barricade that
that was placed on the Clive steps in 2020. There's a campaign in London, uh, some of you might have heard of it, it's called the Remove Clive campaign, which wants the statue removed to a museum where it can be more carefully contextualized. But for a number of reasons, that's um, impossible. I mean, how do you separate the statue from the plinth, from the, the plaques? It's, um, what do you do with, you know, the, it, it's very, it's tactically difficult, and there isn't a museum in London, frankly, that wants it either. What about the statue in Calcutta? Well, it's already in a museum, which makes it easier to interpret. And at the moment, the Clive statue has been magically vanished by surrounding it with mirrors. It's a playful example of how a statue can be temporarily erased without being physically removed. What can we learn in London from the Victoria Memorial? If the statue's location can't be changed, how can we recontextualize it? The Victoria Memorial has made a bit more of an effort to engage with this question than, uh, than we have in London. Statues like these were created to tell a one-sided narrative. But today, they've become a focal point for rethinking national stories and post-colonial relationships. In London, we too need to think a little bit more laterally about what to do with Tweed's Clive sculpture. Thank you. Not three questions today. <laughs> I'm Priyadarshi, and thank you very much for your eliminating, uh, you know, presentation. Thank now you. you have shown that how history has been can be manipulated, can be doctored, can be hijacked to suit a certain narrative, which is utterly false and you know uh, utterly false and f full of untruths. Now, for from the Indian point of view, you know, from the Indian point of view, the British rule from Clive to Winston Churchill is a dark and satanical uh, period where you know when the British came, 23% uh, of the economic, uh, gross economic uh, uh, world, world's 23% of the gro gross economic income was with India. And when the British left, it, it reduced to 4%. And how we saw how you know, our manufacturing industry, how our, our uh, handroom weavers, as the, British, uh, the East India Company being traders, how they destroyed India's trade, the handloom weavers, the muslin, which was famous all over the world, how they came and destroyed it and how they took away our raw materials and you know, took away the entire manufacturing industry to Victoria, uh, manufactured, manufactured in the British mills, uh, Victorian mills. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and you know, Clive is associated with four things. You know, when we see Indian history, Lord Clive stands for four words, smash, grab, loot, and plunder. That's what Ro Robert Clive stands for from in Indian history. In fact, the loot word has entered the English language through our words. The loot was not a part of the English language. Hmm. It has entered through the, vernac it was the vernacular word, yeah, which has entered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is the thing. Now, my question is, you know, that today, in today's modern world, when we are thinking uh, uh, fresh and anew, the Germans, for example, today, they are ashamed of their past. We saw how when Willy Brandt, you know, he went to Warsaw, and, you know, he went on his knees and apologized for it. And at the 75th anniversary of the World War II, we saw the German president, chancellor, all, you know, recognizing what the, the harm, the, the, the depredations the Germans have done. Mm -hmm. Italy has recognized it. They, they sent repatriations to Libya. So is, your question is why do now, why, so why do you think, the, why the British are so blind, so deaf, and so <laughs> ignorant, or deliberately be ignorant, to what they have done? This is a good question. All the harm, the depredations, the evil, the yes. with, the, with cruelty and inhumanity, inhumane behavior to 
towards the people uh, towards india even churchill you know 40 he killed 44 million right. bengalis you know your, your so that is the question your question is yeah clear. that is the question yeah. right fine Well, um, I, I don't know if uh, maybe some of you have heard of an author named Satnam Sanghera, a British, uh, he's a journalist who writes for the Times. He's written a book called Empire Land. And his book is, one of the things that he addresses in his book is why is it that colonial history is not taught in British schools? And his book has become a bestseller and he he keeps giving copies of it to school libraries um he's he's really he's trying to raise awareness um of what happened and you know bringing this issue up that you know it is important that you know in britain they people need to be made made war, more aware of what colonialism did to other other countries um uh, my son is about to start his uh, A levels and he's chosen to do history. We were invited to an open evening and I came up to the head of the history department and said, "Are you going to teach about colonialism and imperialism and the British Empire?" And he said, "No. They teach about Russia. They they teach about the Soviet Union, but they don't teach about the British Empire." even though we're in britain you know he's studying in britain and i agree i think it's um it's something that needs to be rectified there was a lady there who wanted to ask a question yes please <coughs> Hello, myself, Dr. Sriyoshi Roy Chaudhary. Uh, such a uh, fascinating talk. I learned a lot from it. Uh, actually, I'm drawn to the cartoon uh, that is the India directors in the Saad, which you showed. Such an interesting one. Uh, I want to know: uh, Is it a commissioned work, and who is the cartoonist? Rather, I'll say who is the artist of this work. Um, Let's go back to it. <coughs> um we don't know who the artist was okay it's um i it's it, it was published in this uh magazine town and country and uh very notably it was published at the time when uh the royal academy's exhibition had ended and the painting had just been moved into east india house um What what else did you what did you, did you say about it? Actually, I wanted to know the artist. You said that it's not yeah. Known. There's no and, uh, artist named. Yes, yes, I, I understood. Yes. And who commissioned it? Can it's rather it, I think it was it's much well, more difficult. Yes. To well, I mean, say. Town and Country was this you know um, a satirical magazine. You know, hmm. it was a, a topical magazine. They 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 published some pretty spicy cartoons. Um, So it would have been um, a, a, a town and country such commentary. Such a significant content, actually. Yes, it yes, and it's such. well, it's it's really interesting as well. Yeah. The uh, the script that goes with the cartoon is um, it's written uh, as if it, it as if it's a play. Yes, and, and it moves over time and space yeah. also. If yeah, you and analyze the uh, cartoon. It, it's very complicated. Yes. I mean, it's um. Uh, the the scene for the play mm. is described as a tavern and of course east india house at that time but its critics often compared it to a tavern you know they said it's just you know it's a tavern it's a it's an old boys club you know um and there are other things happening the um the director who's sitting in the background in the sort of high backed chair mm. uh is uh named in the script as um uh colbrook uh robert colbrook and um who is the uh no thomas colbrook robert was his son i think um and colbrook was caught up with this alum scandal which i'm not going to get into here but of course alum was an ingredient in soap mm. so uh some people have also said that this cloud you know the sort of the, the suds are soap suds but yes. i much prefer the uh interpretation of the suds is i mean you you can 
you can guess you can guess what the title means if you interpret the name suds as um, as sewage. Thank you so much. But even though it is published in that magazine, it's not clear that uh, they probably didn't commission it. They maybe have just published it. It was freshly published. It was published in the year, the same year that the painting was exhibited in the Royal Academy and then moved to East India House, 1772. Yeah. All right, yes, yes. <coughs> On the very first painting which you have shown of uh, Francis Hayes, who never visited India, but drew this painting there in London. It is evident from the elephant, which is an African elephant, not Asian one. Secondly, if you watch the picture once again, you'll find the focal point of the painting is the British Red Ensign. Is it symbolic of establishment of British power? My question. Sorry, could you say that again? Is it, um, I, I take what you say about the elephant. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, this is. But if you see the whole picture itself. Yes. Or the painting. Yes. Forget about the elephant part of it. The elephant. Yes. The main focal point is the British red ensign. As if it is being handed over here in India. Is it the transfer of power? Transfer of power from. Um. Or, or establishment of, I, sh I shouldn't say transfer of power, establishment of British power in India. You want to ask um, it's, it's a symbol of imposition of Yeah, British power. exactly, exactly. That's what I mean. I think it's a bit more sneaky than that. I don't think it's so much imposition of British power. It's, you know, trying to convince the British public who would have seen this painting that they were doing this really swell thing and look, these guys are really good friends, you know. It's, it's pure propaganda. That's what it is. That's what I think. All right. Uh, can I microphone uh, uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Um, uh, fascinating. Question uh, fascinating presentation. Um, you know, <coughs> my qu since you brought about the comparison with the uh, statue and the symbolism surrounding uh, the statue in Victoria Memorial in, in Kolkata. You know, I had a question and I, w I would like your thoughts on this that you know, for, for all the, for everything around the buzzword of decolonization now, and that's a global buzz. I mean, it is true about the British Museum, it is true about museums in India, and so on and so forth. But at least in the UK, and in other parts of the world, in the wake of Me Too, and in, in, in the wake of George Floyd, you had these tumultuous protests against racism and empire. In, 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 in the UK, the Edward Colston statue was, yeah. <coughs> uh, was dismantled. You had a removed life campaign. Um, and in the US, Confederate statues were you know, re relocated and all that. I'm talking about, the, uh, about Kolkata and the Victoria Memorial Hall, and I'm, I am sort of party to the whole idea that I'm, I'm proposing. Is that in, in, in Kolkata uh, and in India, we never had those kinds of, a real critique of empire and racism, uh, which is, you know, which would be analogous to the caste system here. Huh. Even in the wake of those, you know, those events in 2020, and, and the, the conversation that had been going on for quite some time before mm -hmm. that. Uh, the only statue in India, uh, which seems to be the targeted for various kinds of vandalisms, is that of B.R. Ambedkar. Uh, but in Calcutta, and look at the Victoria Memorial, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the, all these statues now are enclosed in glass boxes. And I personally don't think that's really an engagement. It's a, uh, it, it's a, it was a decision taken, not by me, but at a higher level, mm -hmm. 
to create an ambience that would not conflict with an exhibition on nationalism, yes. <laughs> an exhibition on an iconic nationalist figure like Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Mm -hmm. But for a long, long time, the statues inside the Victor Memorial, and, and for some reason, the staunchest of imperialists are inside the Victor, like Clive, like Lord Dalhousie, like Marquis of Hastings, and so on. And those whom you can sort of loosely describe as the friends of India, like Lord Ripon or Lord Benting, are outside in the gardens. They are in the care of bards. Um, but for a long time, the portrait statue of Queen Victoria by Thomas Brock was in fact, you know, people came and put vermilion on the feet and, and the queen was given her place among the Indian pantheon, yes. right? And we have never, and um, you know, I would take blame a, 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 along with many others, we have not really tried to contextualize and, and sort of really curate and inform our visitors who these people really are. And to me, it seems to be a general indifference of Calcutta and Bengal. And I'm just thinking aloud. To really engage into a very critical conversation with colonialism. I, the Bengalis were the first community outside of the English-speaking world to learn English. And and inhabit multiple linguistic universes. So it has a very curious relationship with, um, with the culture of English and the colonial statues and, and all that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm going to. So, so you see, do you think, and, and for all the periodic Debates about, and I have faced this question many times, is the name of Victoria Memorial going to change, going to change, and, 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 and so on, every time a VIP visits. Uh, but the fact remains that we are still called the Victoria Memorial Hall, and we are still located on an address which is one Queen's Way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I mean, whose Queen uh, is this Queen anyway? And so, do you think? The, you know, this is, Clive is just incidental to this conversation, but on a broad level, the kind of critical conversation that has surrounded the statue of Clive and the question of empire and racism in the West is absent in India, as you can see in Calcutta, in Bengal, in the Victoria Memorial Hall. Well, I'm guessing that the statues are going to come out of there glass boxes soon and then yes. everyone will be able to see them again this is it's a it's a temporary um uh adjustment isn't it um i've i've always been of the mind that it's best to just keep these things where they were placed in the first in the first instance i mean i um i'm very interested in the remove clive campaign but personally i think the statue needs to stay there and just the, they we need to find a way of interpreting it i mean as for what you were saying about you know indifference in and not really understanding what um the statues uh in the victoria memorial hall are about um i guess one of the ideas that i've been contemplating is how uh, perhaps the statues in London and Calcutta can somehow be connected virtually through a platform like Google Arts and Culture, yes, yes. which you've already yeah, used yeah, extensively, yeah. haven't yes. you? Um, and that perhaps that's a way for both people in Britain to understand you know, the uh, imperialist background of the statue in London and for people in Calcutta to understand that connection as well. Absolutely. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe that's, that would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, any other last question? If not, we can continue the discussions outside. 
and uh, I would like you to join me in giving a big hand to Jennifer Hart for the very illuminating talk this evening where we got the opportunity to learn a lot of things which we were not aware of. So thank you very much. Thank you. And the discussion can continue over a cup of tea outside. Oh, great. Right, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.